Hey, how's it going everybody? It's Tito from FM Soccer Talk, and today we have an incredible show. It's the guys from Soccer Town USA, Mr. Kirk Riddell and Dr. Tom McCabe. Kirk is a Hollywood TV writer and producer who's worked on shows such as Will and Grace, Spin City, and American Dad. Talk about awesome. On top of that, he's also the president of Tudela FC LA, which is an all-girls club that looks like the city that it represents meaning that it values things such as inclusion, diversity, integrity, and equal play. Most recently, it's partnered up with Nike and Hope Solo to continue promoting the beautiful game. Now, Tom is a history professor at Rutgers University, where he teaches classes like Global History of Soccer. That sounds like a class that I'd want to take. You should sign me up, Prof. Now, he's also the president for the Society of American Soccer History, or SASH for short which was established in 1993, and it looks to promote, facilitate, and disseminate research into the rich history of the soccer in the United States. We hope you enjoy the show as much as we enjoyed making it, and I won't hold you back any further. Enjoy. Um, my name is Kirk Rudell, and uh, I grew up in New York City. Uh, went to college with Tom. We've been friends forever. We were teammates in college, uh, nice. for a couple of years. And, uh, uh, the couple of years that I walked on and got to, uh, to, to shag balls for him and be his backup keeper. <laughs> and, uh, and then I've been a, a writer my whole life. So after college, I started writing plays. I ended up moving to Los Angeles and I've been a TV and film writer for, uh, a long time now. It's adding up. So that's it. I'm I'm West Coast and and he's East Coast now. Yeah, and you say he's East Coast. Tom McCabe. Uh, we ended up meeting. We uh, you you um when you guys were saying you guys played together and started getting to know each other. Uh, this was during some really interesting times with uh, you know Bob Bradley, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Yes, Bob Bradley was our uh, college soccer coach. Yes, yeah, a young Bob Bradley. I want to say he got he Bob went to Princeton and graduated like 80 81 and you know we showed up in 87 so he was a very young college really coach. Young coach yeah yeah, yeah. and, and i think crazy he wanted to pick him back yeah keep it in the family and and he he stayed over 15 years and uh i remember i came down i was teaching and coaching after college and i came down he's like tommy i'm, I'm having a little trouble kind of splitting the difference on these keepers can you train them and give me your your <laughs> input and and i remember i wow. um, locker room with him after we're talking about that talking about his young family michael bradley of course and uh he was like they're starting up this league and i think i need to go and test myself you know so i kind of heard it from him in the old locker room where you know we were kicking That's around crazy. as undergrads awesome. and then to just to see you know he's he's you know one of those great guys who is who has gone from the college game mm -hmm. you know to to the pro game to the international scene and then you know international pro league so yeah 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 but so we met in in, in college um <laughs> Yeah, principal. Oh, no. no. There it is. Right. There, there it is. is. That's Mike. You're Mike. You and me, we're homeboys. Right, right. So he's LAFC. I, I'm a Red Bull uh, season ticket holder. So uh, <laughs> we're both, uh, you know, MLS folk. But yeah, I mean, I'm gosh. New York for everything else, by the way, except LAFC. Yeah. I can't do any other LA teams. But, you know, once they were starting it up and once I knew Bob was going to be here, there was nothing else I could do. Um, but Tom had the same situation. I, had. I, 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 I've seen Bob at training camps a couple of times, you know, at their training center a couple of times and gotten to catch up. And we showed him an early cut of this movie just because, you know, we want to make the coach happy. Yeah. Um, but I told him that, you know, even though I had not seen him for a very, very long time, uh, Michael is one of the markers for me of getting older. And, you know, because oh, when I get it. Tom and I were there, Michael was, what, was he three years old, little blonde kid? And He'd warm us up. Oh, he could strike a ball at like three, four, or five. He would amazing you know, get out so, of preschool and get over there and he'd warm <laughs> us up. Yeah, it was funny. So for him to now be a grown man with his own family and a, and a, and a you know, and a, and a, a soccer, professional soccer veteran right now, yeah. I told oh, yeah. Bob, I said, it's weird because with my own kid, you know, you're just sort of, you, you know, you're, they get older and you sort of get older with them. And you don't really notice it. And I said, but, but your, your son is one of the ways that I sort of feel my age. And Bob said, it's funny. He's like, 
a lot of my ex-players say that. A lot of people <laughs> have experience with them where they just they sort of mark themselves by Bob's kid. Anyway, so that's cool. So being so growing up in that whole area and you start understanding the the history behind it all, um, it kind of gets us into you know the whole movie Soccer Town USA. Essentially, uh, I guess what motivated you guys to get into 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 the movie aside from from your experiences in Princeton and uh, in the in New Jersey area. So, so I'll, I'll grab that one. I mean, I'll go back to my youth. And, you know, I was lucky enough to grow in, up in a soccer town. You know, um, Ukrainian guys set up a youth club there in the late 60s, early 70s. So it was up and running by, by the time I jo- joined up in the, the late 70s. So, I mean, Kirk and I are both, you know, children of the NASL, you know, the Pele generation. And we're playing Cubs, club soccer. We're going to Giant Stadium. And, you know, so it's, it's all... Um, around us. And um, I was traveling youth soccer to Kearney multiple times a year. They were one of the rivals. I was a couple towns away. So I grew up in that immediate Were they area. everybody's rival? Y- yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Everybody, <laughs> everybody wanted to go to Kearney. I know so, what that feels like. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I distinctly remember on that dusty field that's featured in the film, the Gunnel Oval, you know, which is literally in the swamps of Jersey. You can see the Manhattan skyline uh, from those fields. I remember being across the field from Tony Miola when I'm nine or 10 years old. He's in one goal. I'm in the other goal. And you knew this was a soccer town. So I, I think from those beginnings you know it was mysterious it was kind of a, a mystical place for me so then you know as i start studying you know the game in in college i wrote a paper and then graduate school you know it was always kind of this area that i wanted to continue to explore so i was writing a book you know telling the you know the story of american soccer through the lens of corny and i get this fateful call from an unknown number, and his name is Kiko Dorn. I call him the first of his kind, Francisco Dorn, right? Francisco, Kiko, mm-hmm. from right, his right. Peruvian roots, and Dorn from his Scottish roots, right? So Carney has gone kind of from Scottish to Peruvian. It's very Peruvian right now. Um, if you okay. went there from the World Cup, they're you know, flying wow. the flag out in front of the Peruvian restaurant. So it's that, that immigration is continual and you know, constantly renews you know, places like Carney. But uh, he says, hey, I hear you're writing a book on Carney and soccer. And I said, yep. And he goes, I want to you know, do a documentary. And I said, so do I. And then that nice. really kind of started kicking in. And, and we were newcomers um, you know, to this whole thing. We shot some what became pre-production interviews. I started getting the story. You know, I wrote the first script. And then Kirk and I had a few beers at a reunion down at Princeton. And <laughs> I told him, I said, I, I need your help. I've got this project and, you know, he'd been writing for years and he was the closest thing that I knew to a TV documentarian. So, you know, it, it, he can pick up the, the story from there. Please. Yeah. I mean, like that's, yeah. I love soccer and, 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 uh, I grew up in, in Manhattan where my soccer coach, my varsity soccer coach was the JV basketball coach who needed yeah. for it. And so I didn't have the soccer upbringing that Tom had. We had a good high school team, but, uh, you know, we had our, our league rivals, but it wasn't, I didn't know what was going on in Kearney. Um, but I love the game. Uh, I love the Cosmos. And, uh, and so I've stayed involved with it in my life, even after graduation. And so when Tom reached out, it's like, hey, do you have any interest in helping me out with a documentary? First of all, reconnecting with an old friend and teammate had to do that. But then uh, getting a chance to try to look at it from a storyteller point of view and not just the soccer point of view, these characters, this world, the immigration story, the American story. Uh, And so Tom's the historian. He's digging through the archives. He's going to U.S. soccer. He's going in people's basements and attics, pulling out VHS (laughs) tapes and, and doing what he does as an historian. And he knew the world, and especially as a Jersey guy, had a, a, a you know was in his blood in a way that it wasn't in mine. But then I had the characters in my head in a different way, and so we sort of knit that together and and built it out together from there. Um, because that's it. Because when we realized when when he first started talking to me about it, it was 
you know, literally, we know the guy was Donahoe that got off a steamship in Brazil, the Scottish guy who walked off the steamship in Brazil with a soccer ball and was like, hey, I got a game. Let's start playing. And there was another guy named Miller whose son went back to school in, in England and played soccer and then came back to Brazil and started Corinthians. So you know exactly when he got to Brazil. And then Tom was telling me, he's like, you know they were playing different yeah. Scots were playing in the Threadmills in Jersey before that happened. Like, yeah. we've had the game longer. And so that idea that, you know, being, uh, you know, uh, being an American soccer fan, you're always told it's not even called soccer. It's called football. You don't even know the right word for it. You got to yep. apologize for loving it or explain why you love it or try to prove to the people you're talking to that you know what you're talking about. And I think what, what was exciting to me digging into this when he first brought it to me and we first started talking about it was – We've had the game for almost as long as anyone. And there's a culture and a history to it here that it's an American game as much as it's pretty much anybody's. And let's tell that story. Let's embrace that. Let's let's give people something to hook into that they might not know about. Yeah, I, I really like that part. Uh, you, you guys sucked me in the movie in the beginning because I myself am an immigrant. Like I was born in Italy, came here, and I had that same feeling of U.S. soccer, right? And watching that, I that's exactly what I pulled out of it. Like it was here first, like that, and I was immediately glued to that section of the the time frame, the years, the mills, different groups of immigrants coming in and forming their own weekly World Cup, essentially. Yeah. And I, that was really fascinating, and it actually connected me. We talked about this, you know, amongst us and and the podcast, saying like. This really made us appreciate U.S. soccer at a whole new level of respect and look at it in a wholly different, a whole different lens. So that it, it definitely came through. If that's what you're saying, you were trying to get through, hundred percent came through. At least myself Nailed as a viewer, it. all Nailed the it. yeah, all the percents. Nailed it. <laughs> yeah, the histor- historian loves to hear that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I, was, I could. Have, it was a big. Yeah, I, I, Tom, we could have jammed more history in there, but we, we stripped it yeah. down, right? We wanted yeah. to get to those three guys, right? Because essentially, it, it, it's kind of like every town USA with a soccer ball, right? They're they're the hometown heroes, right? There's sport, there's high schools, you know, there's the dream of of breaking out and and making it, um, but with a soccer ball, kind of makes it makes it different, and and then that long trajectory uh of soccer and carney is you know can't beat it so from from the the moment of inception right when you first came up with the idea for the for the documentary was it always going to lead into the three guys you know were you eventually going to get to 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 ramos harks and and miola or did you originally intended to be more of a history piece or was it always going to be about that storytelling like kirk says you know like did kirk did you kind of sway the documentary into a, a more of a like not, a, not in that like way. a people a person kind of like storytelling kind of kind of movie or it, it was a great question from the beginning tom was like it's about carney and it and it's these three guys okay and it's as always it was always going to be about these three guys and and then what I was hooking into was uh, kids coming up. My daughter's 15. She's a good club player. Um, kids her age or a little bit older, their sense of U.S. soccer might be Landon Donovan, Clint Dempsey, Tim Howard. Maybe mm-hmm. it's that generation. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Or, you know, it's Pulisic now. It's maybe those guys are the old guys now. Um, maybe Eddie Pope. I don't know. But like <laughs> what they don't realize is because for me and Tom, it's not ancient history. But for kids or for, for players now, this is a couple generations back. Yeah. And I think what we realized is people don't realize the the debt that we owe that generation. And not just these three guys. I mean, you know, it was it was Winalda and it was there were plenty of Ernie Stewart, plenty of other people from that era who who were part of that team and part of that culture but these three guys were the backbone of the team they grew up playing together they're all from the same town that was the cradle of u.s soccer Mm -hmm. and without those guys 
when the NASL folds, if we don't have a good World Cup in 94, is there an MLS today? Or what does it look like? Is there a Pulisic today? And so that was what was so interesting. When you look at those kind of, you know, the butterfly flapping its wings or whatever, those kinds of historical yeah. moments where you go, man, that that goal from Caligari in Trinidad and Tobago, <laughs> if he doesn't <laughs> score that goal, are we talking that he about meant to score? Donovan? Yeah, and it's of funny. course he meant to score. But like, <laughs> so, so that's it. So what we just want, so we kind of, we kind of wanted to also show people now because now MLS is booming. It's great. Everyone's a fan. Everyone loves soccer. And we love that. I love that now when I go walk around, I'm as likely to see a Liverpool shirt on the street as a Dodgers right. shirt on the street. That's cool, mm-hmm. right? For sure. Yeah, let's yeah, 100%. Talk. But what people don't realize was like the game was flickering here. And, and these guys helped keep it alive. But it was close. It was close to going out. And so I think that we wanted to tell the history. We wanted to tell the Carney story. But then absolutely from the beginning for, for Tom, it was always going to be these three guys, these children of Carney, uh, helped get soccer to where it is today in the U.S. And, and I remember one scene in particular. Um, I fly out to Kirk's place. I mean, we're, we're buddies, right? Since we were 17, 18. So he's like, Hey, stay at my place. I think I might've slept on that bed sheet. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, we sit down and it's in, been in an air and out ever since. That's why right. it's hanging up. On. <laughs> right. We sit down. I remember I'm literally at his elbow, right? Like I'm okay. I'm, I'm with, you know, Yoda here or, 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 or whoever. And he goes like this, he clicks his you know, knuckles and he goes, so where do these three guys meet? And I said, they meet at Thistle. They meet at the Scots club. Right. So right. it's, it, it's then this kind of hero's journey, right. You know, this quest to get to the world cup, to, to become a pro, um, you know, it's leaving the hometown. So all those fundamental elements in, in storytelling were there. And I, I, I think the, the kind of the masterful guidance, the influence the, uh, of Kirk is we were able to tease those things out. The, the other thing that, that I believe it was his influence. He can take credit for it. But where do we start? Right. right. So we start in the tunnel. Walking out. For that Columbia match, right? That epic win in in, in, in oh, the yeah. '94 World Cup, and then we work our way back to that, right? So we kind of replay up. that opening sequence, right, right at the beginning, and then you know, right back there, and then we we take them out of the World Cup, and then into their you know pioneer days in MLS, yeah. and, and and that's a classic is, storytelling that's, technique. That's a movie. That's right. It's a movie conceit, right? You start at the you start at a climactic moment, and go, how the hell did we get? Why, how are we going to run a train on a bridge? Yeah, it had, in, how the hell do we end up here? had a very Tarantino feel to it. It was good. I liked it. <laughs> and, so, and so, again, it's like, I think, yeah, even with a document, especially with a documentary, um, if you're just presenting the facts, who cares? Like, the same storytelling principles apply, right? It's, yeah. you got to care about the characters. you got to be interested in the world. And, and the story's got to move. Or you're asking a big favor for people to watch. And so for us, I think that was a big thing was feeling like we got a great story. We've got great characters. How do we how do we tease it out? How do we tell it in a way that, you know, that hopefully people that people enjoy, even if they're not even if they don't know this world, even if they're not soccer fans. My wife came to a screening. We did a, a friends and family screening at the Scots Club in the Scots American Club in Kearney. And uh, we flew in, we flew in from LA, we landed in Newark and, uh, and then went straight to the Scots. And it was great. It was you know a bunch of people that are in the documentary, friends, family, I think the mayor was there. And uh, I wasn't and there. at the end of it, you were not there, but at the end of it, my <laughs> wife we were going into the city afterwards. And she was like, I, actually really liked that yeah and she got not a big soccer fan she knew i'd spent a lot of time on it but what she said which we which i appreciated from the storytelling point of view she's like it's not just about soccer it's about a town it's about friends right and and we're like yeah that's that's a huge part of it and and i think that 
uh, you know, playing the game. What is it if not community? That's why we're doing this right now, right? We all, it's the community you find with your teammates or with other fans or, you know, the, the random person you're, you're sitting next to in a pub and you're suddenly talking about Man City or something like it's community. And so for this community that had the game, so there was so such, this is where they found their, their sense of, 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 of coming together. So I think we mm. also wanted to kind of honor that feeling in it as well. And so that's why a lot of it, and you guys will, you know, as you saw, we tried to have dialogue between characters in the documentary. So when Thomas McEwen is, uh, is, is, is going in at Caligari for not, <laughs> not <laughs> right. to score that goal, uh, it's the shank heard around the world. He shanked it. It went off his shin. It was very important to us when Tom was going to go talk to Caligari. We were like, you got to give him a chance to respond because these guys all grew up talking trash on the courts, talking mm -hmm. trash on the field, talking trash at the Scots. And, and let's get some of that. So let Paul come back at Tom, uh, at Tom, you know, let's give, let's give, that's right. Let's, and then let's give Pearson the last word in our Marvel movie credit <laughs> surprise. Uh, if you're watching just, it's not a long credit sequence, but give yourself like eight seconds to get to the last joke. And <laughs> that's the, great. And, and we tracked him down through a, a soccer friend of ours from Freehold, New Jersey, right? The hometown of Bruce Springsteen. And we're like, where's Grant? He kind of like disappeared a little bit. He ends up, I, I think he manages a warehouse for L'Oreal in, in somewhere in Texas, outside Dallas. And we tracked him down. He produced that video with somebody at work. And we're like, hey, we want to give you, you know, the last word. And, and he was a he was a real sport about it. So it, it was great to uh, to get him, uh, you know, in on that. Yeah. You, so you were talking about like the smack talking and all that kind of stuff growing up. And it was something that I was able to relate to growing up in El Paso. So I grew up in El Paso, Texas, a border city, really pretty far away from any major city. If we wanted to get to uh, Texas, a big state. So if we wanted to get to Dallas, that's like a 10 hour drive. Houston's 13 hours, L.A. 12 hours. And that's like the next big hub. But we were an immigrant city, uh, mostly Hispanics. And we grew up playing similar to Soccer Town USA. So when I was watching that movie, it's telling the American story, something that I didn't really know much of growing up here in El Paso because everybody follows Mexico here. And on weekends of America Chivas, you got your barbecues and people getting intense. So it's a different kind of feel, but very similar, no less, with, with what we saw in the movie. And that resounded with me, right? So you were talking about the, the, you know, smack talking and kind of getting in and it brought me up to kind of where I was raised, right? Growing up playing soccer and it's, it's tough and you, you, you got to say something with a ball, right? I mean, you go in there and, and I think that that's one of the things that you see in Kearney with this, with, with the kids growing up there that we see here. And it ties in with, you know, um, you mentioned the American team, right? About how you saw that that grit was there and it's something that we see now and, you know, uh, we, I, I appreciate that you were able to get that image across and that, that sense across to others. So I'm, I'm sure it wasn't it wasn't the easiest to, to, to uh, I don't know, the, the well, story, the way you story thought it was great. I will say there was a there was a profile that just ran a couple of days ago about Clint Dempsey that you guys may have seen. But uh, Tom and I were talking about that and the way he grew up and his attitude like that's a guy that that that's Carney. Yeah. And, and I think part yeah. of what we, you know, part of what we've told people is, yes, it's called Soccer Town USA and Carney is proud to be Soccer Town USA, but we're not saying it's the only one. There oh, were pockets everywhere. St. Louis had, you know, had its version and, and, and where Clint Dempsey grew up in Texas, right? Like, like that was, yeah. <laughs> right. That's a soccer town, right? It was there. And so, he grew up scrapping and playing pickup and having, like you said, having to prove something with the ball. And I think his mentality and the way that he developed as a player would be very familiar to Tab and, and, and John and Tony. And so for us, that's what's exciting is the image to me is sort of like if Soccer Town was where the game first landed, the seeds kind of blew all over the country and landed in different parts of the country. And a lot of them started blowing around after 94. So yeah. there were areas before 94, 
Jersey was not the only place. There were great players on that national team from California, from Virginia, from Texas, whatever, right? But after 94, suddenly it's everywhere. And now there's lots of soccer towns and, and, and better coaches and, 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 you know, more kids playing. And so, you know, it's yeah. still a long way to go. But the idea was that Carney was a model for it. But what happened in Carney is not unique. Yeah. Uh, Tom, I wanted to ask you a specific question. When you, you know, started putting this together and you were shaping something that was obviously clearly super personal to you, very close to what you grew up in, and then this overall message, um, what lesson do you think people should learn from your film? What was the, what were you trying to go for that you think, I'm going to show this, this is what I want everybody to take away from it, from your point of view? I think it, it, it's twofold. People say that we have no soccer history, and they're absolutely wrong, so you want to demonstrate that. And two, they say we have no culture. We don't have a soccer environment or authentic culture, and, and we do. Um, and it comes from all these different traditions that, you know, that, that come you know, from Scotland, from Mexico. From the melting pot Ooh. culture. Yeah, yeah, it's melting pot soccer. And, and, and I think that's, you know, the... Uh, I used to help coach a team that had a lot of, you know, folks from different places and, and we would talk about diversity and it could be your greatest strength or your greatest weakness. Right. And it's your decision. Right. It can pull you apart or it can just, you know, make you stronger in those, you know, broken places or, 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 or the, 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 the team concept. Um, so uh, I, I think Carney is is one of those stories that you can tease out those two things, right? We've had just as long a history as anyone else, and look at this authentic culture that came across the Atlantic, you know, from Scotland, from England, from Ireland, and and then there's an American twist, right? It's that second yeah. and third, you know, generation, uh, and and that's happening a lot of other places. I mean, like I want to know more about El Paso. Like I want to know more about you know, L.A., like the, uh, I could get into those places and spend a few days and look around and go, oh, I recognize this, even though yeah. it's not Scots or right. you know, the English or, or whoever. Same vibe. Yeah, same, same. It, it's, it's a fun way, a unique way to plug into a community. When I moved to Connecticut, that's actually how I reached out with these two guys, because right. it was just a matter of what do I know? And I know soccer and I could I could play it. So, and that's the community I want to associate myself with. So, okay, where is their soccer? What could I play? I put something on Facebook just to anybody in the area. Is there some pickup soccer? So it was a matter of the community. Well, Kirk uh, uh, mentioned this earlier, right? It's the community you make on the field with the people. Look at you guys. You guys, what, are, uh, what, 20 years of friends? You said you were 17, 40-ish? Wink, wink. But you know what I mean? So it creates, it creates a bond that you have for a continuous amount of time. So... Yeah, it was I, in I, I the totally it was in the movie Tito, yeah. right? That was the quote. We make our best friends through soccer, and any soccer player watching that was just probably yep. nodding their head immediately when they heard it. Yeah. I, I, think, I think I nodded my head the entire movie. I was literally <laughs> like, "This is the greatest thing ever!" Yes. So, I um I have a technical question now. This could be you know answered by either of you, but what we are now getting into this world of becoming content creators. And I was just curious, how hard was it to get some of that footage of like, especially the early, early footage of uh, whether it was like the high school games or even just like the youth games with tab. And uh, I mean, and then just getting it all together, how much footage did you actually go through and look at while you were making the movie? I mean, the movie was an hour and six minutes long. So how, I mean, did you have like four, five, eight hours of footage? How? What did you have to go through, and how hard was it to obtain that footage in order to make the movie? I think we got to the story first, and then we went to look for the footage, right? Yeah. Like the, 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 on the page from the interviews, the stories came out. So we were kind of deciding between two high school games, right? That free hold game with Pearson, which is the one that we really wanted because of it, it, <laughs> so it really good. shows that, you know, the hooligan <laughs> nature. But but Carney also had an epic rivalry with Columbia High School, which is the high school where, you know, I grew up 
in the in the two towns. And there were like 22 penalty kicks. John Harks misses three. Andrew Shoe misses three, right? Because you could kick every round back in, in 83 <laughs> or whatever, right? So we had some footage of that, and it just wasn't good quality. And this high school game from the local cable station pops up. And we're like, oh, it's Pearson. This is unbelievable. So that made the decision for what high school game we wanted to show, right? And we had trouble tracking down the youth footage. You know, Carney's a working class town. They, yeah. you know, th- these VHS things were like huge <laughs> yeah. boom boxes, and, and they were like $800,000, I think, at the time. Uh, sure. So that footage w- was not good, but but there was someone filming the high school games, you know, from the roof of, of you know, the, the school building. So we had those. We had some youth. Um, then I remember the, the great, one of the great sections of the film is Trinidad, right? Cause you get the, the, the feel and the vibe of, you know, this Caribbean nation who's desperate to qualify. And actually, uh, Ted Burnett, who's a soccer dad, uh, of my vintage, our sons were playing together and he goes like, I know a guy by the name of Flex Muhammad. He has some footage. So he, you know, small soccer community. I connect with Flex Muhammad and he's got that footage. Like that's that comes off of, you know, some local wow. stuff he had done. So it's cool there. And then, you know, a lot of the other stuff, you know, we mined on on YouTube and, you know, I mean, I love that 1990, you know, rap video, right? And you know, <laughs> I mean, like how, how good is that? I I had actually forgotten about that rap video until uh, the documentary and then I was like, "Oh, my, I can't believe they did this." And now it was like, "Oh, cuz I was well, that was 90. Was that 90 or 94? That rap video it was 90? 90. 90. Yeah, 90. So I was nine that summer. So I can, I vaguely remember. And I was like Miola's family where I was rooting for Italy, right? I was like, USA has a team. Like, Still oh, am. Okay. So yeah, I mean, I, 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 am, I am a first generation American, but I grew up only watching the Italian soccer. So, I mean, it was the Azzurri or nothing. So, and the, and the World Cup was in Italy, so I, I had no choice. Uh, I mean, I was, I didn't even think I was allowed to root for the USA. I, or, was it Fra- back Franco? Then, so. uh, Tony Miola said in that. 90 world cup yeah. it's like who is my dad gonna root for <laughs> yeah, yeah. and it was a small sentence but I, it, it like struck it me sense. to the core because i was like if that was me i'd had the same question like oh my goodness who's my dad gonna root <laughs> no, for? no i wouldn't even have to ask that question yeah, I but i knew the answer so, yeah, yeah. Exactly. i probably myself would have still been rooting for italy like Shh, all right <laughs> <laughs> but now now it's different tab says that so i mean there were so many other stories that d- didn't make this oh, tab make a part two. so so tab um, makes his way into the youth national team and he's at his first tournament and they're playing Uruguay. He wants to be playing for Uruguay as opposed to the United States. He was like looking over at the other side, like I'd rather be in the uh, Albi Celeste, you know, right. And, 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 and it took time for him to become, you know, a yeah. United States national team player, right. You know, on, on the youth level. And I, I think that goes into a lot of these decisions in particular, for the Mexican American kids, right? You know, they're yeah. they're truly fully Mexican and fully American, and then it's yeah. this pull back and forth. And what are you going to do, right? You know, same with Giuseppe Rossi. I mean, you're talking about you know yeah. a Jersey kid, Clifton, born and raised, but his dream is to play for the Azuri, right? So I mean, these these borders are 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 fluid and flexible. I think, especially with American players, I see it the most. I mean, I. I wanted Giuseppe Thanks. Rossi to play yeah. for Italy. Yeah, I wanted. Uh, him I, to I play totally. For Italy. I was like, yeah, he's gonna play for. And people would ask me, "You're Italian, don't you want to play for the U.S.?" And I'm like, "You haven't grown up in an immigrant Italian family household watching every Sunday, you know, standard definition right said yeah, that's who you play for." Like he went to, he had a chance to go to Italy. Yeah, he's that's gonna where go. he's gonna go. Like I understood it immediately. It wasn't even a a question for us. Yeah. The pre- the president of uh, Thistle FC actually reached he reached out to us on YouTube after after he saw our our podcast, and um, he he said that um, he also played for Thistle too. So I, I didn't know that I didn't know that he played for Thistle before he went over to Italy, which is it's kind of amazing. It's it's nice to know. And then yeah, it, it was it's very cool because I thought that like he was twelve and he just he just shipped up and went we're straight to Italy. I didn't know that he played any soccer here, so. Well, at least we could say we developed him, right? 
Well, that's good. That's right. <laughs> but that's it. But in terms of that footage, it will, like, like Tom said, we sort of put the story together and then work backwards to, uh, to try to find what we needed. But then the actual finding it was, uh, that was Tom as a historian and Tom as a, uh, as, as a, as a dogged investigator and, and reaching out to Tony Miola's family and going, where, you know, where are the, where are the games? And, and being brought down, Mr. Miola, bringing them down to the basement and box after box of wow. labeled VHS tapes of every game Tony had ever played his entire life. Or reaching out to a guy named Chris Gehring, who was another, uh, another Carney guy who worked on the movie, who was, you know, part of the community and connected. And, and, and we'd say, we need this, we need that, or who might have, who's got video of the, of the parade? And, uh, because you can describe the parade, but seeing the guys in the Corvettes is different. And so it was, you know, Tom or Chris or, you know, people calling, well, someone's sister says they might have something at her dad's place and we're going to have to go find it this weekend. And so when you don't have a team of production assistants, it was uh, some heroic work. Once we sort of knew what we wanted to find, then it was a lot of really heroic work from you know, from Tom and Chris to, to, to try to grab it. A lot of Eureka moments, I'm sure. Yeah. All right. That's That's great. What well, was, um, on, on that parade footage, yeah. I'll, I'll briefly tell, we had to go to the Jersey shore. He was not going to let this VHS, you know, tape, uh, get out. And, uh, we went there and, you know, we, we bought, you know, the, the VHR and, and, and the, you know, the copy machine and, and we copied it right then and there. And we're watching it <laughs> on site going, oh, this is so good. And he was pulling out all sorts of other stuff. We have the scanner and we're scanning stuff. So that that was interesting. Another thing that was really interesting, we could not find a picture of the bus, right? The bus that's transporting them from the hotel yeah. that, you know, so like, is, is this myth? Did this really happen? Um, and we had to go through the young women at the time. And their scrapbooks. So the guys didn't have the pictures. <laughs> nice. The girls no. had the pictures. So I remember one night, you know, uh, a young, you know, a woman now, you know, our vintage, you know, is, puts down all the pictures on her bed, and she takes a picture with her camera, and she sends it to me via text. And I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> there's the bus, there's the bus, you know. So it was like that was that eureka moment, right? We yeah. got the bus, and then all sorts of other stuff, you know, like what do you have, you know, and and some stuff was lost in, you know, the, the Superstorm Sandy, right? And, you know, they had it, and then now it's not, you know? And, and that's true of any kind of historical, you know, collection. I mean, I, for, for anybody listening, you know, get your valuable artifacts and documents above the waterline and, and <laughs> stuff, you know, so we can make more films, right? But don't record the mattress fires. Don't what? record those. Recreate <laughs> oh, those later. Okay, so can I... So Kirk gave me the okay I could tell this story. Oh, so, yes, please. Uh, yeah, Kirk. Kirk uh, told me you could tell every story you want. By right, the way, right. there you go. So, so uh, on the recreation of the mattress fire, that was done close to the original site, and we had to get a permit from the Carney Fire Department. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, our director, director of photography, our editor, you know, Rob Penzel, we gave him his soccer name. Right? He wasn't necessarily a soccer guy. I mean. Imagine, you know, like Alfred E. Newman from Mad Magazine with a skateboard. He kind of had that California look, younger guy than us, and he could do everything, right? He'd set up the camera. He'd set up the lights. You know, he'd edit it, and um, he liked to break or, or maybe more adventuresome, right? Like he wanted to throw his drone up at Liberty State Park to get a shot of the, uh, you know, Statue of Liberty. And I'm like, no, you can't do that. It's a no-fly zone. And sure enough, we try to get the thing up. You know, the park police come and they want to confiscate his, you know, drone and, you know, all this. So we set, he wants to just set the fire, a bonfire uh, up himself, right? And I'm like, no, no, we're going to go get a permit. <laughs> and, you know, I, I kind of walk in. do this there. right now. Yeah, 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 exactly. We walk in there and I'm like, hey, we're looking to do this thing. We have some pallets and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do this. And, and the guy's like, sure, sure. And, and he goes, I'm going to waive the application fee, right? 
I know what you guys are doing. So we go down there, we light it up. It's a good deal. And, and you know, the, the, it's a recreation. I, I think one of us is wearing John Hartz's like varsity jacket from 1983, <laughs> you know, like all that. And now the fire department's showing up and we want to go film them coming in. So we got to move our cars. And let's say Bobby Wood put his camera down in the parking lot and one of three vehicles ran it over. <laughs> <laughs> so, A, you're worried about the camera, right? It's this guy's livelihood. And B, did we just lose the fi- footage? <laughs> it oh. C, regardless... It's going to be the most expensive recreation of a bonfire that we've ever <laughs> seen. Right. So, yeah. Oh, uh, you know, yeah. The travails of movie making, right? Uh, sometimes those are the best stories, right? The stories behind the stories. I'm sure there's tons. Um, what was your favorite part of the film? Uh, so, I... There's, I don't know, there's, there's a bunch that I like, and you know, I've, most of what I've written in TV has been comedy. So, you mm-hmm. know, I love, so the funny moments we were able to build up. Have you ever heard of Spin City? Yes. Glenn Grace, America. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Ed, right oh, yeah. So, Ed I look, was- so, you know, having, so Caligari, you know, busting Thomas's chops, or or some of the, the some of the moments with, uh, Galka and McCourt, where it's like the old friends giving each other a hard time. I love those moments, and we we work hard to kind of build those moments from a comedic timing perspective. But I will say, um, the moment that I that is probably my favorite. Uh, as I've gotten older, I don't identify with the players anymore. I identify with the dads that built the club. Um, that's what I did out here in L.A. a few years right. ago. Is yep. some parents and I helped right, right, build right. an all girls soccer club out here. And so Charlie McEwen, who's the white bearded guy, uh, which is more and more what I'm looking like these days. <laughs> but, you know, he ran the sporting goods store. He would give equipment to kids that couldn't afford it. He'd help drive the VW bus to games. And, you know, it was one of the one of the parents who would try to help provide, a you know, a club, a safe place for these kids to play. And, you know, the moment where he's talking about uh the ones that didn't make it and, oh, yeah. and thinking about those kids, you know, there was a famous trip where they, they got to go tour and went to Scotland. And, uh, you know, this is a guy who these, he, he, he grew up, these kids grew up with him and he was sort of a, a surrogate parent and, or, yeah. or, you know, for him. Mm-hmm. and him, I was, I was back East and in the Scots for, for a few days as we were doing some of those interviews. And, uh, was there for that one. And that one, as soon as he was telling that story, I was tapping Tom, like this is in the movie, you know, and and just because it's, uh, it's ultimately a movie about, about, about wins, right. The 10, you know, about getting wins, but I think it was important to not forget the people that, that didn't get all the way there. And so for me, that's a moment when I watch it, that, that always gets to me is, is, his face and his memory and that, and, and kind of remembering the ones that didn't get out because everyone he knows, remembers them because he remembers yeah. them and everyone knows, you know, and Harks will talk about it in it. Like the most talented kid that didn't make it. Um, Brian Dunseth out here who does, you know, who's on serious, serious, right. Brian will talk about the best kid he played with was like a Mexican American kid who just used to destroy everyone. And then, had to stop coming to practice because he was working as a valet because his family needed the money. And so he would just show up to games and then he couldn't, he couldn't come to games anymore. And Brian's Mm -hmm. like, that kid could have been on the national team. That's the best kid I ever played with. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think all of us, you, everyone knows the ones that didn't make it for whatever reason it was. And in Carney in the seventies and eighties, a lot of times the reason was, you know, was drugs or alcohol or, or, or poverty. And, uh, and so we didn't want to get bogged down in it, but we did want to take a moment there. The way we took a moment after we, after, uh, the Escobar goal, where we just felt it was kind of our responsibility as historians in that moment to kind of, you know, just 
give a moment of silence for for some for some people that didn't get all the way through. So for me, it's not a fun moment. Um, the movie's yeah. a lot more fun than that, but that's the one that that always gets me for those. It's reasons. a powerful one for sure, man. The sentimental part. Yeah, that's a that's a good one because everyone, all, all of us, has probably played with somebody who didn't make it or either got caught up with uh, drugs or passed away. You know, there was always everyone's got a, a story from their childhood growing up you know tom what about you what was your favorite i mean you must have so many favorite parts so it must be so hard for you to choose one but like do you have like a favorite quote favorite favorite what oh boy yeah i mean some of the one-liners are 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 classic you know what one apparently is a meme right now when billy galka uh who is now the high school coach at Carney High uh, <laughs> gets called out by uh, Robert McCourt, who is the head men's soccer coach at Monmouth University in New Jersey, right? So they're both, you know, uh, professional coaches. He says, you know, he was like Joe Pes- Joe Pesci on crack, you know, like, it's, so, so that's <laughs> apparently now, it's not going around around now among all the, the, the <laughs> guys who have played for, for Billy and, you know, played, for, you know, for Robert. So, uh, yeah, th- that was Certainly funny. There are a couple lines. I don't know if this is a family show or not, but but there's a a, a couple lines that Thomas delivered that didn't make it into the film mm-hmm. and didn't oh. make it into the blooper reel. Um, and and if you give me you know the, the thumbs up, I'll, I'll I'll share one with you. Okay, so we're talking <laughs> about the Columbia win, and Thomas is trying to encapsulate it and. I was just looking at the transcript before I sent it to Kirk. Um, and, you know, like, hey, could you take another run at that? You know, could you say that over again? And he says, U.S. soccer had the biggest heart on that day. And we all <laughs> wrote it. <laughs> and then what an wrote, ending. And then he goes, he goes, that didn't come out right. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It came out just as you expected. <laughs> Oh, so we desperately toyed around with putting that in or use it in the blue part. And we're like, you know, no, I, I think, Kirk, you got a message from, you know, some youth organization in Southern Cal saying, we'd like to send it, but we need some bleeps in certain spots, but, right? Yeah, no, it's great. I sent it to like one of the executive directors of, of one of the leagues out here who's great. And she was at the Columbia game. She's a huge fan. She knows Ralph Perez. And, uh, and she's like, I loved it. She goes. I, I. She goes. I would send it out to the entire league, but yeah, the 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 f bombs there are gonna gonna be a problem. So I had to deal with that. My club. Uh, one of the coaches asked if they could do a movie night for some of the girls over the weekend and watch the movie. I'm like, yeah, it's great. And it was the 2008s, nines, and tens. And so I told the coach. Oh. So we're talking about you know basically nine to twelve year mm-hmm. old. Probably. And so I. So I told the coach, I was like, just so you know, ahead of time, there's going to be a little bit of language. Movie's totally fine. It's family friendly. But there's one guy who's going to be problematic. <laughs> yeah. uh, so we just got to. But with Thomas, he looked, the dude is hilarious. But we also, in editing, we had to go a little's a long way. A little goes a long way, right? Like, he's great. If there's too much, the magic kind of breaks. And then it's just a guy who's cursing at you all the time. And then with not naming names, but yeah, there are people who have uh, positions of authority with children right now. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and so some of the stories from those, that trip out to California, we were like, those are great stories. We probably want to do them a favor and not put that in the movie. So Joe Pesci on crack made it, uh, we do, but we talked about that one too. And fine. And ultimately, yeah, we're like, it's in good fun and it's two guys who are friends just, you know, giving each other a hard time, but uh, we definitely, uh, but we definitely, we were trying to be, uh, responsible to, to people who had trusted us to tell their story. T- tell them about the, the favorite scene that the nine to 12 year old, uh, California girl soccer demographic um, loved. So the, the two moments, cause they're, you know, the girls are watching the thing and they don't really care about a bunch of guys playing <laughs> pick up with each other and giving each other shit. But, they loved the game footage because they didn't know how the games turned out. So for them, it was just exciting. Like they were chanting USA and typing messaging during the Columbia game. But the moment that they loved was when Tony looks to the stands and is, and Sal's got his shirt off and he's about to go streak. 
<laughs> yeah, they all start cracking up. And I'm like, that's amazing. It's always good. Look, it's watching something with an audience is always very, very informative, right? Like it's anytime you get the chance to make something when you can when you can watch other people react to it, it the jokes aren't always where you thought they were. The moments don't always land the way mm-hmm. you thought or other things are a surprise. Cool. And yeah. That was one where I would not have guessed at that moment, but they all went nuts for that one. If um, that that scene is what I love about these kinds of stories, but like you know, we've watched that World Cup. Uh, it's it was, it's my first impressionable World Cup. Uh, I was here. I went to two games uh, here at, in Massachusetts, and hearing the story of Tony Miola having a buddy in the stands that just texted him, "I'm going to streak if you get a shot." Like you don't know that's going on. And when you look back and you know that's happened now, like to me, I'm a huge fan of like finding the funny and everything. So I'm like really connecting with that part. So that was amazing to see. And I, I just I love that that made made it into the movie because I think it humanized a little bit that these were really college kids, you know, representing the United States of America at the highest of levels against Colombia, against Brazil. Uh- and you're hearing about his buddy in the stands who's drunk saying, I'm going to go streaking, you know, in the background, <laughs> that's actually happening. And that's awesome. Yeah. Or the night before the, the Swiss game, right? Yeah. Where <laughs> the OJ chase is happening. We love it. I love, I love like, Harks I'm talking glued. about it. Yes. And that's right. Or Harks is like, yeah, you know, you're a professional. You get your rest. You do it the right way. You know, I'm, I'm a guy who's going to go play for Sheffield Wednesday. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm a hardworking professional player here. And, and you know, it's like, his roommates watching TV and won't turn it off. And I like that stuff. You're thinking like, this is right before the biggest game of your life. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, and, and it's just at that point, it's a buddy comedy of like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's like, it's, it's Felix and Oscar. It's the odd couple. So, so another, great. another great <laughs> moment that didn't get into the film. I love these. Please. The, I know. The, um, the the U.S. national team is in I want to say Cocoa Beach, 1989, days before the Trinidad game. Right? They're kind of in concentration. They're training, and Tony's telling the story, and then Paul Caligiuri is the other one involved. They're kind of fighting over the couch with the small TV in the common room, and they're watching like soap operas or or whatever. And they're right there. Like one guy's on the couch, the other guy's, you know, seated on the ground, you know, right there. And Tony goes, I can see the headlines now. Caligiri scores, Miola <laughs> shut out, U.S. goes to the World Cup. <laughs> How about that? Days before it actually happened. I mean, like. They had F- the wow. dream. I, I think that's why they were, you know, we talked about that's why they were successful. They had that, like, pickup feel. You, you fight to stay on if you want to keep playing. Your Franco says it all the time. They were representing someone back home. They were representing their family, their friends, their town. They felt like they were they were playing for someone, not for themselves. And that's what he feels is the biggest difference from then and today in mm-hmm. U.S. soccer. And it, it it's such a good point. And when you watch this movie, it comes through even just – Having their hooligan friends, you know, in the stands are there. That's their town. That's their buddies. And they're playing for all of them. And they grew up doing this street soccer, fight to stay on, grit, sliding on pavement. You, they didn't, Brazil doesn't scare guys like that. They're like, oh, I'm, I can't wait to play this game. And I think that was, that was a difference maker. And we've lost that Absolutely. a bit. Yeah. I think we have. I um I know that we're we're coming up to an hour, Kirk. So I just want to be mindful of everybody's oh, time. Um, but but I I I do want to kind of transition from from the documentary. I mean, the movie was great, uh, but I know that you guys have kind of been talking about it a lot since it, since it released. And uh, we we want to get to know you guys a little bit more and actually get to know, you know, what you feel or how you feel about like uh, soccer, like just globally like how what it's looked like and how it's changed so we just have a couple of fun questions that we'd like to ask you and i have one in particular is so much has changed from the hooligans and the silent now we have silent sidelines instead of people yelling at goalies and making fun of them you know what i mean you can't even say anything on the sidelines now so this is more in terms of the game so if there was one rule you can change about soccer right now what would you change or change back to or cancel or get rid of us so is there a rule in today's game that you would get rid of or change i love and this that's, question 
So I'll give you a second. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go. I'll say a, a rule like I'm a purist. So VAR out. Yeah. Like, you know, I was just watching, <laughs> you know. Um, Our soccer team loves you, Tom. You know, the, the, yeah, this is football and, and Colina is on there. And he's like, it's very subjective in this game. I get to make the decisions. I get to impose my personality on the game. And like everybody knows that, right? Because the ref gets announced, at least at that level, you know, days before the game. And so then people are calculating, okay, we got this ref. He, he's, you know, quick with the yellow card, right? So then that factors into the drama of the match. So yeah, man. VAR, VAR is, is gone. Is gone. Um, and then the other, I think, in, in the American youth landscape, the practice that that I would like to see changed is parents showing up at training. I would love to see clubs drop them off and go do something yeah. else. Um, we we have we have that in our town in Shelton. The, the parents either have to stay on the opposite side of the field or they're not even allowed on the field, which was kind of hurtful for me. So I immediately was like, I have to be a coach because there's no way I'm going to sit on the sidelines and watch someone that I know is not as good a soccer player as me coach. <laughs> So <laughs> humble brag. So uh, I'm just it's yeah, it's humble, but at the same time I because I have an old school like you mess up, I'm gonna make you do like push ups if you're like fooling around, you know, you're running, you know what I mean? Like that's that's how I was raised. Oh, and I feel like good. that's how the kids need to be raised because <laughs> this whole uh like breakout line and the no heading, I don't know how I feel about it yet. But what about you, Kirk? Do you have any any I'm gonna changes? say the big one I'd love to see is I'd love to see the uh, the hockey style substitution on head injuries. Okay. I feel like I just I want to see I'm tired of seeing guys stumbling around the you know stumbling around after a clear head to head because they don't want to come out and the adrenaline's kicked in and it's now the coach's decision or and and it's just that that's not how it should be and I think from what I see in the youth game to, to seeing it at the highest levels. Um, I'd love to see people have proposed it like, you know, uh, basically a free 10 minute substitution of someone's got a head injury so they can be evaluated mm -hmm. and then let them reenter if they clear or if they don't clear, then the substitution takes or whatever yeah. it is. But I'd love to see us be a little more, uh, uh, careful Mindful. with guys yeah just careful with guys health and, and livelihood and 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 futures um with head stuff that's the one thing it's just it's it's the greatest game but uh but that one bugs me and also i will say the the you know love pep who doesn't love pep mm -hmm. um, and he didn't start it but i think he's popularized the the tactical foul on the counters and the valverde yeah, uh, and I gotta uh, say, like, I, it, it sort of feels like it starts to feel like hockey at a certain point when hockey was just turning into, uh, you know, like just a, a or, or basketball in the '90s, yeah. where creative players weren't allowed to be; they weren't given the space to be creative. Um, and so, basketball put in rule changes to let guys not get destroyed every time they came into the paint. I feel like, you know, every time, you know, whatever, De Bruyne picks the ball up on a counter and you just know someone's going to, someone's just going to chop him. And maybe it's a yellow or maybe it's not, or it's just a shirt tug. And it just, I just feel like uh, I'd love to see that punished a bit more. Mm. Well, it's funny and because we, we had a whole podcast on it where we did, uh, is it cheating or is it tactical? You know, yeah. and it's, there's really is a fine line. I mean, I got called like, out. Get it. You guys, you guys might remember the you play. Did. It was an You're Arsenal. It was an Arsenal game where um, Genduzi just tackled um, yeah. Saha in the middle of the field. Zaha. I mean, Saha was really gone, but it was not a, not a red card, yellow card, and that was it. Play was called back, and that was it. So, I mean, to me, it's, as a gooner, it's a fine I totally so, endorse that play. I don't think Kirk Kirk. No, we're like best friends, dude. We're, we're Red Bull fans. <laughs> we're Gooner fans. Uh, do you have an Who's Italian? Team? Who's your Italian? I'm Who's first, your Italian but good. How are you guys friends? <laughs> no, I know. We don't talk about that's that. how the be that's where best friendships are made from the soccer <laughs> field. They can lightly. Well, yeah. Literally, during, during the beginning of the movie, I don't think we really went after each other. Now that it's out and released, I, I think our, our true selves uh, will, will come out and we'll start attacking each other. Uh, that's good. 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 
Yeah, I was like, Quinduzzi is to David Luiz as Baby Groot is to yeah. full grown Groot. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's true. So, that's, my, yeah. that's my picture every time I see those guys. That's right. fantastic. We have a few more questions if you don't mind. I mean, if you guys Yeah, of course. Talk. All right, All right let me, uh, So, th this is a big one for me because so these guys are pushing me constantly that I have to pick an MLS team. I am Serie A, I'm an Inter fan. This is what I grew up with. And they're like, you're in America. you got to pick an MLS team. So this year yeah. I said, all right, all right, I'm going to pick an MLS team. And then now there's no MLS going on. So now I have to like spend my time. I'll get the time to research and pick one. But one of the debates that came up is Franco believes the MLS is going to be F the biggest FC league. FC Cincinnati. FC Cincinnati. Yeah. 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 I'll root for your boy. But you know, do you think that they're, right now they're going to, instead of hiring a, a good American coach, they're going to bring in some foreigner. We'll talk about that. Well, I mean, that's another conversation. <laughs> that's Let's have, let Paulo make his point. Uh, I don't know. I, like, I, I, this so wait, have you picked one or you're still up in the air? I have not. I have not picked All one. Right. No. Yeah, but so what's I'm, the question, Paulo? The, okay, the question is, Franco believes the MLS is going to be the biggest league in the world in five to ten years. Agree or disagree? Disagree. Okay, that's fine. I, 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 most people do. Most people do. I just think with the money and and the and the lure of all the nice cities and the country itself, I just do feel like eventually the biggest players with the most money are going to come here. I mean, it's grown exponentially over the last twenty years. Was it twenty five no years there. now? So I think it's a I think it's a legit yeah. selling league in a few years. In five okay. years. Oh, okay. I think it's a legit or five, let's say five to 10. I think it's a legit and we'll see, look, we'll see what, how everything shakes out after everything going on in the world right now. But the money is good. Hard to compete with premier league money anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Um, and so everybody. they're going to, right. So they're going to Hoover up everybody. It's nice to see Syria building back up. Um, you know, the Bundesliga has its own financial structure, so they kind of do their own thing. But it would be nice for MLS to be Liga, ah, you know, what, like, like, you know, like yeah, a solid five in the world, right? Yeah, a, a legit theater. That's yeah, right. Yeah. That seems yeah. that seems, you know, reasonable. But you're right. We have some friends who are involved with MLS franchises, and and the the lore out of South America and Central America in particular. Is, is you get to live in America, it's stable, you bring your family, you know you're going to get paid, you know, the, mm. the quality of life, you know, it, it's going to lead to a green card and citizenship. Like, so, if, you know, the you play the long game there. It's a very interesting uh, uh, thing. But, yeah, the big money, I mean, if you're throwing millions and millions out, you know, per year for m more than a handful of players, right? I mean that's why Mexico is better, right? I mean the, they, the, their wage, you know, bill is, you know, mm -hmm. they have twelve DPs, where, you know, Major League Soccer has what three, four, three, you know, four, yeah. yeah. That's what they're allowed. Yeah. Um, so I guess changing it up a little bit, um, if you were to name your favorite player and your favorite game. I know that as a historian, that's going to be interesting. As a soccer lover, you also I'm interested in cricket as to what you're going to say about that. So, favorite player, favorite game. Mm. That's like is on the clock. <laughs> Top five games on the board. <laughs> I'll give you my favorite uh, player, Dennis Bergkamp. Ooh, good one. Classy. And, uh, that goal against Newcastle. Yeah. And, and I, I got to see him, you know, obviously on TV, got to see him, you know, live at, at, at Highbury. I lived in England for a year. Um, favorite game. I mean, I'll, I'll stick with the Arsenal. And I remember my brother-in-law, who's not a soccer guy, you know, flew through the night. We go right to uh, Highbury and it's Arsenal Everton. And Everton is going to the Champions League the next year. Right. And, you know, Henri is just dismantling one goal, two goal, three goal. It's like three or four goals at half. And then it just continues in the second half. And, <laughs> uh, you know, four, five, six. And my brother in law looks at me and goes, Is this normal? And I'm like, <laughs> This is not normal. Right. And then they get that sixth goal. And then I look at him. I said, They're about to kick the extra point. 
you know, so <laughs> seven nothing final, and it was, you know, an, an epic, you know, so, so I got to share one of my passions with a family member, right? And, yeah. and in this, you know, he had been to plenty of U.S. sporting events, right? You know, he was a Philadelphia area guy, so Eagles, Sixers, Phillies, you know, all those annoying yes. Philly fans, right? And, and he was like, I have never seen anything like this. That's a impressive. European soccer match. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, Very cool. I'll be the dumbest American ever and say Pele <laughs> because he played for the Cosmos and because, and because he made soccer magical. And so even though I could never play like him, and even though, I mean, look, you, you know, look at Messi and look at Ronaldo and look at Zidane and, and all the greats that have come since, um, no one's forgetting Pele, but at the same time, I mean, yeah, like he's the goat. And so yeah. as dumb as it is, he's sort of the, he's sort of the, he's the, he's the first obvious one you go to. I, think I don't think that's it's dumb for me. That's it. But <laughs> no, it is my favorite game. game. <laughs> and I'm, a, I'm I've been in soccer since I was like two years old, right? I've been, I've been kicking the ball since I was a child. The king is the king, right? El Rey. The king is the king. Yeah. So yeah. you can't overthink and, it. And Messi and Ronaldo did not star in a movie with Sylvester Stallone. They can't put that right. their <laughs> resume. So let's. And by the way, the best part of that movie was Michael Caine jogging around pretending he's <laughs> Stanley Matthews or something <laughs> out there. Right? Yeah, so, yeah. But favorite game, I'm going to go. Uh, I'm going to go LAFC, Seattle Sounders, oh, opening nice. of the Bank of California Stadium in LAFC's first season. Because I was there uh, nice. with my kid, the, that's the uh, the general uh, hits the hits the free kick in 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 added time past Stephen Fry, and the place went nuts. And so, mm -hmm. the magic of being a part of a new club. So now you know, go old school that's, and dump that, yeah, LA. Yeah, yeah. But that was now, really good. Couldn't be, couldn't could, be, could, you know, could that's Can I get like, one more? Can I add just one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You want so it, go I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go family here too. So oh, going, I know what yours should be. We're gonna, yeah. going to <laughs> Cincinnati to see <laughs> my be. son's first MLS store. Yeah, that's okay. Awesome. He told us a day or two before. Uh, I call my wife and I'm like, hey, gotta get me a flight. Boom, I, you know, and and I was pretty nervous. I didn't normally get nervous, but it was one of those things. Like when you, you know, when you go up a level, right, do you belong? Right. And yeah. I, I had oh, watched yeah. him, you know, from youth level into the youth national teams and in college and this, and then I'm there. He's better than me. He knows more than me. You know, that that's long since, you know, those ships have passed. But from my eyes, I wanted to see, does he belong? And about 10 or 15 minutes in, I'm like, he belongs. Hell right? yeah. And then now it, it's just. He has to break through, right? He has to, you know, yeah. pay his dues, you know, stay healthy and, 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 and break through. But that was cool. You know, yeah. that yeah. was really cool. Yeah. Oh, That's yeah, really I believe cool. it. Those, those are great responses. Uh, Kirk, I actually thought you were going to say Tottenham versus Inter when Tottenham destroyed Inter. <laughs> when, but I, I, you did it. So I thought you were going to go there, but you did it. But okay. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's all relive that, that together. Bale, that was when Bale was a defender. But uh, you actually bring up another point. So another topic that we talked on our podcast. What happens if your son goes to a rival team? I always think about this. Like if my son... So I'm a Sampadori fan. Daughter. Yeah. Or daughter. Or daughter. Yeah, your child. So if your daughter, your daughter's son grows up. Imagine he went to like NYCFC or or DC United, and now you go to a Red Bull game. Like, what shirt do you have on? Do you have a Red Bull shirt on? Do you have your son's shirt on? Like, who are you? Who are you rooting for in that game? You know, that's like Tony Miola. It's the Tony Miola father question. This is the yeah, dilemma. Is. Right. Yeah. So, so I mean, Cincinnati came to Red Bull Arena. Uh, Tommy was not in the squad. Oh, yeah, um, you lived this. But but I had I had a uh, you know FC Cincinnati uh, sweat top that he gave me on. That's good. Yep. Yeah, yeah, everyone. Yeah, you guys are good. Yeah. You guys are good fathers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we man, that was Cincinnati was not un unfortunately. Well, you know, it doesn't matter now. But Cincinnati was not playing LAFC here this year. They were playing them in Cincinnati. So I had been planning to. Uh, I was going to go to the Galaxy game 
and wear my my Tommy McCabe FC Cincy jersey out cool. to uh, whatever nice. they're calling the Galaxy Stadium these days. I can never keep that. <laughs> I, I think there are like six, <laughs> there are six people in the whole world that have like McCabe FC Cincinnati jersey. That's right. It's it's, it's a small but proud crew. It's a yeah. solid six, though. That's right. Very dope. And then really um, I. I guess we uh, we wanted to finish it off with a couple of rapid fire questions, and then uh, if that's cool with you guys in terms awesome. of word association. Yeah. Sure. All right, go Four ahead, Paulo best. Franco. Yeah, let's see. Uh, so this is your pick. Wait, 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 introduce this. You guys uh, didn't so, see when I first joined, and it's awesome. It's so much fun. Yeah, so it's just it's just fun. What we do is well, I'll just say a couple names, and you just tell me the first thing that pops up. So if I like, for instance. An easy one for you guys. And we'll do Tommy first and then Kirk so no one's talking over each other. But you both get the same name. Uh, Tony Miola. The Big Bear. <laughs> Meatball. It's now forever cemented in my head. Meatball. So. Um, All right. Tom's got a go, 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 go. Kirk's the comedian, right. so he'll get all. He'll that's why I like Kirk can go first on this one, and then I'll all let right. I'll let I'll let Tito and Paulo go next. But um, Bob Bradley. Uh, tough. Ooh. But I, I know that's hard. That's a hard one. Uh, tough, yeah. but in the best possible way. Do you, you think know, he's and, the, and, do you think he's the best American coach? Because uh, I do. Yeah, but I'm biased, and 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 I also was a walk on for two years with him. Tom was the one that knows better. Tom was the Tom was the four year starter for him, so Tom can speak to him as a coach. But you know, I got I got yelled at a few times, which was exciting because it meant Bob knew I was there. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, I would let Tom take that. Bob Bradley calculating right he's he made himself a student of the game right i i I see him in in this kind of Mourinho, benitez wenger kind of role where they not a top player right there was no pro league you know he couldn't have but then he traveled the world studied people studied tactical systems um you know took on you know after we left princeton he was a Big AC Milan guy, right? Flat back floor for, you know, like t- took all those tenants and, and and he's improved, you know, each, you know, step of the way. And and then I I would say worldly too, because like what he did in Egypt, mm-hmm. an amazing yeah, that was tough. soccer and humanitarian project. I mean, total respect for there's a there's a documentary yeah. on that, isn't there? Um the soccer pharaoh or the american yep. pharaoh or something american like that pharaoh. american yeah. pharaoh yeah i gotta add that to my to my queue so that's it i don't know if anyone else if paulo or tito want to go but uh me i'll okay. give you two go for it sure sure i'll, I'll give you two uh tom charlie stilitano the boss uh, the, uh, the boss the uh, soft yeah. boss kirk the last the last button <laughs> <laughs> So, so hey, you, you talk about I, I wanted to be a lawyer, and, and Charlie is a, a Princeton soccer alum as well. So we knew right. Charlie when we were in, in college. We've known him a long time. So I worked for him in the summer of 1990. I was his clerk, clerk. And he would say, hey, uh, I need Tom. And there was another player, John DeZazio. I need Tom and John, and we're, we're going to go you know, off-site and, and do a little research. We, we went off site. We went to games. his house. We watched the games. Then we'd go to like the Italian restaurants in Elizabeth, New Jersey. He's given us homemade pesto. I mean, it was one of the best. It was as it ever. should be, Tom. It was amazing. It was amazing. one of the highlights. One of the weirdest moments of making the documentary was we were with Charlie interviewing him at the Scots Club. And he said, you know, you know, Sir Alex Ferguson. Ding. Sir Alex's aunt. <laughs> yeah, ding. That's right. You know, his aunt still lives in Kearney. He has been, he's been to Kearney many times. His aunt lives a couple streets away. You know what? I'm going to tell him I'm here. He's going to love this. Takes out his phone, bip, 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 puts it on He's on a holiday. Yeah. He was in the south of France or something like that. Charlie's on the phone. Sir Alex. Hey, how are you, my friend? Guess where <laughs> I am? I'm at the Scots Club in Kearney. Yeah. Hey, Puts the phone down on the bar, puts on speaker, and goes, "Say hello to Sir Alex, boys." 
And it's like, what do you say? What do you, what do you say to Charles? You say hello, Kirk. Say, that's what that's you amazing. say. That's it. So it was great. But that was Charlie. It was perfect. It, and you get, you, get what you, you get your money's worth when you interview oh, Charlie. Great. All right. He uh, when, would be go, go, go. a great documentary. Just following him around. Just Charlie. The power circles yeah. that, I mean, he's, he's got a hug. for. I don't know what he's going to do in this, you know, post-social distancing. He gives a hug to yeah. everybody. I mean, the guy is probably struggling right now, um, just not seeing people and meeting people and hugging people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're big fans. Um, okay, my last one, I'll say, uh, we'll go Kirk, Greg Berhalter. Uh, the, the giant blank I'm drawing is because uh, my jury's still out. I don't know. Um <sighs> Clever. Clever. And I don't know like, if that's a good thing. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm going to say I'd clever. like someone to call me clever. Say, I'll say it's good. <laughs> I'm going to say I think he's a smart guy. I think he puts the work in. I think he's thoughtful. I think that he's thoughtful about what he wants to do. I think that sometimes you can be too clever and maybe try mm. to do something that maybe be so committed to the clever, cool thing you're trying to do that you don't look at what you're actually doing it with. Yeah, and yeah. and well so, so that's all. So I'm going to say, look, the guy knows more about the game than I ever will. And, and most teams in this country would be happy to have him as a coach and have been, and he's been successful, but clever. And I don't know if that's always a good thing. Could be good answer. Great answer. I'm going to go back to the first time I met him. I'm going to say Gray B. So I am a college senior. I want to teach and coach, and I taught at St. Benedict's Prep for about 17 years. Wow. That's where Tab Ramos went, Claudio Reyna, yep. Greg Burhalter, yep, yep, yep. Claudio and Greg were classmates, along with our dear friend, Paulo Nunes. And, uh, Great name. I'm, I am in the back of the class. I can see Greg and Claudio because I know who they are. In front of me, and in the middle of the class, Greg goes from the front row to like the third seat, third row, and then the, in the middle of the class, he's just working his way back, and then he's right in front of me, and he leans back and he goes, "You went to Princeton? What the hell are you doing here?" Right? <laughs> I think he had to get to you. <laughs> right? He works his way back, you know. So like, I was mesmerized by that, you know. Like well, this guy's got a lot of balls, you know. Like this, <laughs> in the middle of someone's class, and then I got to play with him and Claudio weeks later that summer. Um, it was like under twenty three, and you know I was still under twenty three, and you know they needed a goalkeeper for our club, and and, and they were involved. So uh, yeah, I got. I mean, and Claudio was Claudio. You could tell he was going on, but I'm like, who's this guy? Greg Berhalter. And it was actually Greg Berhalter and his brother, Jay Berhalter, who's helped run U.S. soccer. We're, we're right there. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's kind of a lot of Jersey guys. But I, I love telling that story, um, <laughs> you know, about what the right. hell are you doing here? You know, very direct. I would say direct. Direct. Right on. I was zero. actually going to ask uh, just two here, right? Uh, Tom, Bruce Arena. Oh, boy. Um, the Gambler. Ooh. Okay. Okay. And I think he gambled on taking Landon Donovan and Demarcus Beasley to the 2002 World Cup, and it totally paid off because they were young. Remember, they and were they yeah, they were, were not they? necessarily fit, and they didn't pay their dues. And he took them, believing that it was a young man's game in that World Cup in particular. Right after a long European season, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of top players were tired. And let's throw these two young guys who have no fear and are going to run up and down. And, and I think they were kind of that added mix to a group of veterans that, that helped the U.S. have a good run. Yeah, they did have a, they had a great team that year. I'm going to I was say watching stubborn. Him. Stubborn. Stubborn. Can, and kind of like clever. Can be a good thing, too. And I think, look, the guy could be hanging out in a beach house right now and watching games and doing commentary and he chooses to put the tracksuit back on or whatever and, and go <laughs> to new england because yeah. uh, because i think 
he cares about his legacy. I look, he also, I don't know what, what's in his head. He also might just love being out there and the rhythms of the game and, and all that. But I think, I think that he is determined to, to go out with some wins and to yeah. not have what happened in Trinidad be the last, the last thing for him in, in the game, at least as a coach. And I think yeah. that, 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 stubborn that determination is again like maybe maybe it maybe it was uh what what maybe it didn't help that night in trinidad but it had helped the u.s in a lot of other games over the years and i think that there's something very it's why he's successful i think is he's gonna he's gonna get he's a terminator right like gonna get back up and keep coming at you yeah, I saw it was like a 2006 documentary about them getting to the 2006 World Cup, and it showed him talking about Trinidad and Tobago, and uh, they 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 showed like a in camp feel of them being at the hotel. So it's a hostile environment. I could totally see uh, how that was difficult, and him going on the field and saying he's going to do that. I think stubborn, very good depiction. But all right, uh, Kirk, real quick, uh, the last one, um, Jurgen Klinsmann. Uh, um. Uh... Uh, I'm gonna just honestly the first thing that comes Manhattan Beach. Cool. That's that's okay. what comes to mind. And and again, like I don't because he was out I in just, LA. Because oh, he lives out in LA and he hangs out in Manhattan Beach. And I think that has been it kind of defines him now to me, uh in 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 some positive ways and also some of the worst ways. Is he's just he's a guy that lives in Manhattan Beach and and that may have infected a little more of him. Well, I should. I don't know if it was. Man, I don't know if Manhattan <laughs> Beach infected him or he infected Manhattan Beach. But I'm gonna say Manhattan <laughs> Beach. <laughs> I'm gonna know. say. What did just. What did? Yeah. I'm gonna say great player, not a great coach. Mm, yeah. He was a great player. Yeah, he was sure. definitely a better there. player than a coach. Yeah. Do you think that we would have um, qualified for the World Cup if we kept him instead of switching to Bob? Uh, it's hard. I mean, everyone asks that question, yeah. and it's here. It's so, here. So what, what, we'll so. we'll go back to the to the film, right? And and I think in 1990, 89, right? Yeah. An inexperienced group um, ended up qualifying for the first World Cup in 40 years because of of that grit, because of that desire, because mm-hmm. of that hard work, right? And I think Klinsman clearly lost the locker room. And and then they couldn't recover, you know, from that. So if if Klinsman was still there, I think it would have been a problem. Yes, yeah, it would have been. And I, and, and I thought Arena was going to be a good stopgap measure, and I thought it was kind of courageous on Sunil Galati's part uh, to make that call, uh, but it didn't it didn't work out. And remember, we were inches away, you know, from going. Clint Dempsey hit the post late in that game. Right. So I don't think it, it would have papered over some of the other problems, um, but but it would have gotten us to the 2018 World Cup. And, and, but maybe we'll see. If it, I mean, look at all that's happened. I mean, like the development academy gone as of today. MLS has a new, you know, elite competition as of today. Right. And I, I think you can draw a line between not qualifying in Trinidad to that. Right. You know, let's relook at, at, at development. Yeah. Well, I think, and that's it. Look, when we, when we didn't, I think if we, if we'd kept Klinsman, we would have kept, we, he wasn't going to win the locker room back. We were going to keep having guys play out of position. And, uh, I don't think that we would have qualified although, and I think Bruce did a nice job getting us close and a lot of stuff had to go wrong that night to not mm-hmm. make it. But I think that after that, Tyler Twalman goes on a six minute rant about what oh, do yeah, you think yeah. in U.S. soccer, yeah, right? Everyone's tearing their hair wow. off. us. Right, Lyle's going crazy. Tony and Dunny on Sirius are doing two-hour specials on how do we fix U.S. soccer. Everyone's talking about fixing U.S. soccer, and Tom and I are working on this documentary. Going, what's everybody saying? Everybody's saying we got to fix U.S. soccer. We got to get, we got to get, uh, we got to go into uh, like underserved communities and get mm-hmm. lower-income kids playing soccer because club soccer is too expensive. We got to get kids playing pickup again. We got to get more technical. And Tom and I are looking at each other, going. Everything they're talking about that we need to do to revolutionize U.S. soccer is what Tony is doing. Yeah. yeah, it's all 
they were all doing it already. We know we know what the answers are. We've been doing it. The successful towns, the successful players we've had grew up doing that. And so um, so there was something that also but at the same time, everyone was saying this is what we got to do to fix it. And then I think Carlos Cordero wins. And the big thing was, let's get the World Cup and all the big the big reform project that everyone said had to happen just stalled. Right. And so I think that now what's the news that we're hearing this week with the DA, you know, the, yeah. all this stuff going on, this is what should have probably happened a year and a half ago. And it just got delayed. But I think we're finally looking at the chance to maybe rebuild the pyramid again, come out with a new coaching handbook. You know, in U.S. soccer, hopefully they won't do what they usually do, which is pick the country that just won the World Cup <laughs> and steal what they just did. Yeah. <laughs> so it was Germany or if it was the Netherlands or it was France, every time someone wins, like there's a new plan and we're going to go. And I think, I think that what, again, just come back to soccer town, what Tom and I keep saying is we don't have to look abroad. We've got, we've got our soccer, we've got our, our passion here and we're the ultimate melting pot. You don't have to go to France and steal how France did it. We got French people here. We got Italians here. We got Germans here. We got it like, Everything is here. Our style can be so exciting. Mm-hmm. You know, we've got, I'm in Southern Great California. To that. Like, right. Let's get, uh, why is it that on the women's, the women's team is fantastic. At least they still win, but the world's catching up. Why are there no Latinas starting on our women's national team? How is that possible? Um, how can we open it up? Because our soccer is going to be fantastic. All the answers are here already. We have to stop looking for Klinsman to come tell us how to fix mm-hmm. our soccer. And I think yeah. that we fell for that for too long. So still falling for that. Franco, yeah. uh, say a lot you about know. that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. For sure. well, I, I'm actually glad that you brought it back to soccer town USA because, um, uh, I know again, I'm just trying to be mindful of time. We're on 90 minutes now. So oh. I just, um, so I'm just, uh, I'm, trust me, I can talk and we can all talk about this. We could share stories all night long. But um, I could go put a pot of coffee on if you guys want. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I love coffee. But um, my, my, my real, the real question, I think the, uh, a question that I think our listeners would like to know is, um, is there more to Soccer Town USA? Kirk, you had mentioned that like there are other towns all over the world I mean, all over the country that are like Soccer Town USA it just wasn't the first, you know. But the, I know right in Stratford, Connecticut, that there's people balling all all night long till one, two, three o'clock in the morning. And same thing in El Paso and now in L.A. Mm-hmm. So are you are you thinking about maybe turning Soccer Town USA into a series and maybe doing a history on <laughs> all of these other towns and going all over the country and turning it into something that like is it, it just – feeding us more and more of the soccer town USA feel because it was literally, and I hope you don't mind me saying it best U S soccer documentary ever. It was one of the best soccer shows I've ever seen. I hope you don't mind me giving you an amazing. Oh man, that's amazing. No, please don't do that. Please don't do that. But uh, I think I just think if, 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 if ESPN came to us and said, we want, we want a six part series where you go and dig out the stories of some of these other towns, a big one like St. Louis or, or, or a smaller one that, you know, that's more of a town. Like, yeah, I think Tom and I would go, sure. We yeah. love the story. We love, we love, uh, we love doing something for the game. And, and again, in a, in yeah. a, I mean this in the most modest way possible when everything kind of fell apart this year and we realized we weren't going to go sell this thing right now. We weren't going to be able to hit festivals and set it up in a sort of traditional way yeah. anytime soon. Um, it's why we put it up on YouTube for free is because ultimately it's a story that we love and we just want to share the story with, 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 with guys like you and your listeners and, and, and the community. The, it's a big, there's a big soccer community in this country. And if this movie makes it feel a little smaller, if it gives it, if it gives some people something to talk about, something to, you know, if it sparks memories, oh my God, that's like my pickup when I was growing up in El Paso or whatever it is, mm-hmm. then, then that's the, you know, we love that and we'd love to do it again about anything else. I'll, I'll concur 100%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Very good. Well, if there's I'll, anything you need yeah. to get into Connecticut and ESPN, let me know. Um, Fantastic. See, we'll be <laughs> What, what did you say, Franco? We wanted to do a uh, 
uh, <laughs> go play a soccer match down in Kearney if they could set it up. Oh yeah, our, our boys so, against their boys. So a little, a little bit of background on us and me. So I'm the I'm the manager of the the over thirty team in, in my town. I've, we're I'm almost forty now, so I'm hoping to move over and create an over forty team and then have two teams. So we play in the Shoreline Adult Soccer League, which has been. It's one of the oldest leagues in Connecticut. I, I know that it's been it's been in existence for over forty years now. I think um, we we've had at least one team from our our league represent um, represent the state of Connecticut in the national cup, and w- more more teams from Connecticut have won the national cup from the SASL than any other team in the country. So, like soccer is huge, and like I just. I would love to bring a team down to down to Carney and have it have a game and it would just be awesome. And a barbecue. So, yeah, Franco's so, are. Uh, so, I mean, I want. So the guy. So the guy. Club. I want the Scots and Like, I want my own club. I want a place where everyone comes right. to after the game. That's All my right. that's my dream. Like, Tom, that's who is so, the, the guy the that guy, organized the everything? Guy who reached, the guy who reached out to you uh, from the Thistle Club. Yeah. Right. Yes. The president. Of, I believe his name is Michael Mara. Right. Oh, so yeah. he's yes. probably either side of 40, probably north of 40. Yeah, north of 40. And um, he plays on, I think, the over 30 Scots team, right? So he's the guy. He could yes. get the, he could get the field. He's like, we'll go to the Scots after, you know, and, and we'll 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 have a game and, and we'll we'll host you. That that's that's easy, I would say. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> great. Oh, man. That's right. We can help. Uh, hopefully hopefully the send soon and, and, so we can and get then back. I would, we yeah when when things go by and then what I could offer, um, because I'm an over fifty goalie, I don't know if I'd be competitive in that game. Um, I give a driving tour, of it goes from Harrison from Red Bull Arena, oh, you know, by the soccer court, historian driving and, tour, and, and then around you know so you know this is where Archie yeah. Clark who scored sixty seven goals in nineteen twenty five twenty six a record that stood until Leo Messi broke it you know five years ago. This is the first house he owned, you know, making money from soccer, you know, playing for Bethlehem Steel, like that kind of stuff. Yeah, going uh, going way back, you know, where Tab and Tony and John lived, you know, that, that type that's of That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Can we that bring Charlie? Yeah. I have to give it to Charlie. <laughs> I've offered um, giving it to Charlie, but Charlie's not far away in Westfield. The ultimate would be game, Scott's Club, and then eat. The basement. At Charlie's. <laughs> House. House. Yeah, he's a big uh, cookie, right? He smokes cook, meat and, he and everything. For Sir Alex, Carlo Ancelotti, Jose Mourinho. They they come to his house and eat what he cooks. We're, so that, we're that, right there with those guys. We're you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's almost equal. So, right. All right. Well, I as much as it pains me to give a, a closing goodbye farewell, because literally this has been especially for this podcast, joining these two uh, has been the best thing that's happened to me uh, in my soccer career. Uh, I'm having so much fun. And it ultimately coming to this with you guys, we just want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for taking the time, um, giving a shout out to us for the podcast on Twitter when we did the Soccer Town USA uh, pod episode. That was fantastic to see. Um, putting it out for free on YouTube, it just proved to all of us that you guys actually, you love the game as much as we love the game. And there's no, there's no denying it. You guys are legends now to that. We watch that thing on Facebook, just get posted and posted and shared every other day by someone different. Uh, like, look what I found. Look what I found. People were discovering it. Um, we've certainly all agreed. It is a 30 for 30 ESPN quality level. And Franco thinks it's the best one. So there's no, this isn't even just saying you're here. So we're going to tell you how great you are. That's actually how we felt when you guys weren't in front of us, that's how we spoke about it. Um, So we started this to share soccer stories because it's fun and you get your friends and you make your best friends through soccer. So coming here and sharing all of your stories has really been just a pleasure. We could just sit back and just listen forever. So thank you. And thank you for two going old guys. Out. Two old guys can talk forever too. So yeah. I'm a time. You guys talk. are great, man. We love the dynamic of you guys. It's, it's yeah. all awesome. keep it going. Thank yep. you so right, much. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers, so everybody. Man. Cheers. Salud. Cheers. Salud. Salud. Cosmo. Nice. <laughs> Take care, gents. That's older than any, older than any of you. 
Thank you. See you. <laughs> Thanks. See you guys later. Bye-bye. Take care.